Hey everybody, welcome to Madden Science. We're doing atmospheric pollution part two. So the first part we did really sections 7.1, 7.4, kind of just an introduction to air pollution here in our AP Environmental Science units. Um, I was trying to fit in there a little bit of indoor air pollution and then noise pollution. But pretty much we ran out of time. So I split it into two. So it was part one, and this is part two. So we missed a whole bunch in there. If you didn't get to see that one, probably gonna watch that one first. Here's what we're focusing on, focusing on for now. Same ideas for flipped lessons, notes, drawings, questions, calculations when you need them, and then some interesting and insightful, um, if we can, some cool research, good news in the comments below along with the time stamp as to where you got it from. All right, so seven, five, indoor air pollution. We've got a whole bunch of different vocab words, so you can skim through those. Here's what we're highlighting. Turns out that indoor air concentration for air pollution is higher than outside. And we're gonna look at a number of steps that we can do to limit that. So here's the overall source of primary sources. You can see in the attic with asbestos, which is partially outdated these days. In the bathroom, you got not just chemical exposure, but biological in the case of mold. In the bedroom, uh, this is probably the one you come up to most with off-gassing, say of a mattress, or if you've bought a new pillow anytime recently, say like some memory foam and it just Thanks. I know I have and I've had to leave it outside for days on end trying to get rid of that nasty smell. What is that? We got your garage or carport, home office, which interesting enough has a number of sources of air pollution, including volatile organic compounds and ozone, in the case of photocopiers. So I think I'm going to try and run our time lapse for ozone detection at school next to photocopy machine. See what happens there. Um, kitchen, so again, another biological source with bacteria. Living room, I've got a quick focus on the fireplace, so burning wood residentially, not just in your house, but say outside in a fire pit or a campfire. Everyone loves it, not so good in terms of air pollution and air quality. Uh, and then if you got a basement, Got another uh, bunch of other complications there with air pollution. Here you can see another, oops, a little bit too zoomed in. Uh, again, leaving off with basement beneath the house, radon risk. Again, a second leading cause of lung cancer is radon. Uh, we bought this house somewhat recently and certainly did as much homework and research as I could on the effects of radon and what you could conceivably do to decrease that. Um, unvented stoves, pets, pesticide, obviously things that you'd know like tobacco smoke, uh, these days vaping, another um, issue with pollution. Again, addicts, the bedroom, the bathroom with cosmetics, clearly the garage. Most of the time you're able to smell these things. Some few stats. Maybe let's try and decrease this number right here. So if we're spending 90% inside, let's get outside. Again, two to five times higher concentration of air pollution inside. Some of the common causes right here. Uh, this is a big issue in the developing world along with the developed world in places where heat and, or heat source and fuel for cooking is coming from wood or coal or um, dried animal waste, those things are gonna release a whole lot of particulate matter. It can be pretty toxic and harmful. Uh, ventilation would be an important step to decreasing that. We got here with tobacco smoke and radon, pretty significant radon arising in the ground from the breakdown of uranium that's naturally occurring. So in some places there's very little you can do about that. Here's radon on the periodic table of elements. Here's a map that's showing geologic potential for 
radon emissions. So we are in the low region right now. I know that growing up, I don't think we had high, but we were certainly in the high region and in that part of northern New Jersey, nearly everybody had basements. So we had a radar, a radon detector in our basement. We got model organic compounds inside. So these are things, again, should be coming up anytime you're purchasing new things, trying to decrease the amount of these chemicals in your home. A really interesting article, formative article for me growing up was in National Geographic. It was called The Pollution Within. And the author measured something like 240 or maybe it was 320 different pollutants that were in his body, did blood and tissue samples. Now, some of that is, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, right? You're just going to be exposed and probably doesn't have all that negative of an impact. But when you can make a change, it might be a decent idea, certainly for things like flame retardants or phthalates, things in your shampoo, soaps, cosmetics, things that you can do to limit that. Uh, we're looking at buying a new rug. How do we get a rug that isn't going to be off-gassing? If you got carpet, again, you got kind of double-edged sword of off-gassing chemicals and also trapping dirt and dust and pet hair and mold, perhaps. So keep stuff clean. Uh, here's another picture of VOCs in your house. Perfumes, repellent, nail varnish, uh, scented candles. Just don't do it. You probably got electrical lights, um, the bottle organic compounds released from candles is not good. Just like, truthfully, inside fireplaces, not so good. Uh, dry clean clothes, disinfectant, solvents, varnish, glue. You can see a view into some of the specifics. PBDEs uses flame retardants. You might see some of these on a label, say for your um, couch, for instance. Say, hey, this... You know, California has laws against it. They're going to show up on their uh, PFAs, uh, bisphenols. This is a big deal with like BPA and eliminating BPA from the plastics that we cook in and drink out of. It's probably why you might want to opt whenever you can for glass and stainless steel or even cooking wise for stainless steel and um, cast iron, even if they are a pain in the butt. Uh, phthalates, so you'll see like shampoos and cosmetics that say no phthalates. Obviously pesticides, heavy metals, dioxins and PCBs. Here's another top-down look at the toxicants in your home. So the word toxin versus toxicants. Toxin would just be the naturally occurring toxins. Toxicants would be the ones that are produced and um, by industry and by humans. So human-made toxins. You can see all over the place in the kitchen. Thinking clearly we're not, shouldn't be too alarmed, but just a little bit alarmed. We've got bedroom and bathrooms. Scroll down, living room. Again, many of these things overlap. And then the outside things that would be in, you know, carport or garage. I uh, mentioned earlier that living organisms, oops, one pass, living organisms also pollute. Uh, so the idea of you know, highly damp, moist areas, dust mites, mold, fungi, mildew, um, sick building syndrome, estimates are up to perhaps maybe 30% of buildings would uh, fit into that category. And as we're getting tighter seals, there's less air exchange, that's why, especially on a beautiful day like today, keep your windows open. Open your windows as much as you can to facilitate air exchange. Maybe you decrease that two to five times greater amount of indoor air pollution as compared to outside. Here's just a quick infographic on sick building syndrome and some of the toxicants present there. mentioned fires. So we did our at-home pocket lab air analysis. Turns out my neighbor was having a campfire the other day, so I brought it over. 
here's what happened. Anyway, so we got this pocket lab looking at particulate matter uh -huh. as it relates to uh, air quality. So when this thing blows close, we got it up at, so it's measuring 2.5 microns, so PM 2.5. And it's topping out right at about 250. So normal, this is down at basically zero or maybe four. So quite a big spike when this thing jumps in your face. Most people don't realize if you're at a fire, you know, inside or outside, it really changes your air quality bad. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else is going on. So carbon dioxide, normally hanging out around 400. Uh, jumping to 1400. Whoa. It turns out the American Lung Association has some pretty strict guidelines related to wood burning emissions and how they threaten lung health. Uh, this is fairly surprising to me. Uh, here's an interesting diagram in the San Francisco Bay Area for their particulate matter pollution. The greatest chunk of that, one third, is from wood smoke. I imagine in more southern regions where there's warmer climates, tends to be less amount of wood burning for heating. Um, so I think that particulate matter component is going to decrease just a little bit. You can see here from the EPA, burn wise wood smoke in your health. Um, talking about some fairly significant rinse, risks, so ways to reduce it. Make sure that wood is dry. Um, keep a moisture meter. Uh, make sure you're burning it cleanly with an up-to-date clean burning stove and give it lots of air. Don't let the fire smolder. All right, last. Noise pollution. Not a whole lot in terms of vocab. So kick back over, maybe keep it going. Bring out your decibel X at different times. Really cool. Um, just another shout out to our go here. to our Unit 7 playlist on here. Lots of good information on there. So decibel X, here's a sound levels. I don't think they got um, Seahawks Stadium, I guess the loudest football stadium. The NFL, but like crazy loud. So here's where we might find different things. Uh, this again is the data that we collected in class and at home. Really cool book. So haven't read it yet, but I did listen to the Fresh Air interview on NPR. So really cool by David Owen talking about volume con control and what we can do to help protect our hearing. So wish I had heard this earlier when I was a kid and before I went to a lot of concerts. Even though at times I did use some ear protection. Uh, from now on, I will definitely be using ear protection anytime outdoors. Um, and in that vein, if you can get some electrical outdoor gear, right, battery operated, lawnmower, weed whacker, these things that are a leaf blower are awesome. I got them for the new home. They're pretty good price. They work great. They're so much quieter and they don't smell. So you're getting rid of tons of air pollution and noise pollution. Here you can see some noise meters for the ecosystem, construction, trains, light traffic, heavy traffic. Uh, keeping in mind the noise pollution, not just a detriment to our health, but the health of the ecosystem and the organisms there, including birds. Here you can see it, noise pollution with birds and froggies, and we probably heard about it in water with marine mammals uh, and beyond. So not just marine mammals, but octopus and squid. Here are some really cool, interesting ways to combat noise pollution. You can see that traffic management, noise barriers, different brakes on trains, insulation, driving styles, different roads. So all sorts of different options here. This goes to show what's going on with boats. This is something we talked about this past summer on my NOAA teacher at sea and the impact of different ships and really the technology to lower the noise pollution and noise profile of ships, which is becoming more and more important. 
and one of the really cool things, one square inch, and looking at making different places kind of a silent or noise sanctuary. So this place, having in near where I used to live in Olympic National Park, so outside of Seattle, really beautiful to think about how it is that we protect spaces away from human-made noise. All right, last, real quick, just some slides on light pollution. So not actually part of Unit 7, but thought it'd be important to look at. Transition from 50s to present, different technology on lighting, befores and afters. And then us currently. All right, that is it for part two of Unit 7, Air Pollution. Hope this helped. Give me your best comments below. We'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.